Shalom, Shalom, peace, uh, Israel. Welcome to our um, Fellowship of the First Resurrections uh, weekly Bible study. Our weekly Bible study is Friday nights um, at 8 p.m. And they will be premiering on YouTube every Friday night at 8 p.m. Um, today's Bible study lesson is going to be covering uh, Romans chapter 1 and 2. What we're doing is uh, eventually, and this is Lord willing, this is going to take some years to even accomplish. Excuse me, but um, we're going to do an exegesis of every book in the Bible. So right now we're starting at first with the epistles of Paul. So we're going to start with his first epistle in the Bible, which is uh, Romans. Um, and just go through it chapter by chapter. So today we're going to be doing um, chapters one and two. Going forward, we'll probably do more than two chapters uh, per Bible study. This one had to be limited to two chapters because since it's the first one, we have um, historical context and background we need to go over. Because with every book, we're going to give historical context and um, also um, background information on it. Because uh, you need to have that information when you're reading the Bible. It's very helpful. Um, tomorrow's Sabbath lesson, as you see, will be at noon. Um, and the title is, Are You Following After the Nicolaitans, Balaam, and Jezebel? Uh, all right, we're going to open up with prayer and then jump right into the slides. Uh, you'll see me after we're done with the slides when we're actually getting into reading Romans chapters uh, 1 and 2. But dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to come together and study your word uh, as a body of Christ. May this Bible study be insightful and uh, give knowledge to your people. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. All right, so we're going to start off with some background information on the book of Romans because, um, like I said, it's very important and will add to your understanding when you're reading the Bible if you have a background on what you're reading and also if you have historical context for what was going on in the world and specifically in the regions you're reading about um, at the time you're reading. It is very helpful. So, um, and I got this from the Concise Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, um, edited by E.A. Livingston, Oxford University Press. Um, I skipped one paragraph out of it because they start talking about how um, Paul possibly died um, and some other stuff that we don't know is we don't know that to be true, so I cut that part out. All right, uh, Romans, Epistle 2, Epistle to the Romans. The longest of St. Paul's letters, it was sent from Corinth probably circa A.D. 58. <clears throat> After a formal opening, Paul points to the universality of sin and concludes that no one can be justified before God by the works of the law. And we know that works of the law is talking about uh, the cardinal ordinances, the law that was added because of transgression, which is um, the animal sacrifice laws and the Levitical priesthood laws. Basically, the sacrificial and offering laws and the Levitical priesthood. Um, justif justification occurs by the righteousness of God, which is revealed in the gospel of his son, whom God set forth to be appropriation to reconcile sinners to God. This free gift is appropriated by faith. Paul rebuts the suggestion that in such a situation, we might as well continue in sin that grace might abound. So just letting you know, going, these are some of the main concepts in the epistle. Paul also discusses that even though we have that grace now, and the grace is really just the blood of Jesus and how we don't have to do, we're not doing animal sacrifice anymore. And um, as long as we keep the commandments, Christ has died for us, so we're not going to have to uh, die, you know, the second death for our sins if we follow after Christ, keep his commandments, and have come into covenant with him. Um, you know, then, Lord willing, we'll, you'll make the first resurrection. Um, but Paul um, actually taught against using that grace as an excuse to be like, well, I don't have to keep no law, um, which you hear a lot of today. And 
actually in tomorrow's Sabbath lesson as well, um, we're actually going to deal with that thoroughly with scripture, that type of thinking, because that is one of the doctrines that was taught um, in the early church that Jesus had to address in the book of Revelations. All right. In reply, he points to the change in character affected by baptism. This guy, and the change in character after you get baptized is at, the baptism is symbolic of you being it's a symbolic thing. But it's also you're supposed to wash yourself with the word of God. So after you've been baptized and you enter into covenant um, with God, then you're supposed to wash yourself with the word of God. And that's what we're doing right now. Even with this Bible study, we're just studying God's word. As you study it more, it'll change you because you'll start acting the way it tells you to act. Um, discussing the destiny of the Jews, most of whom have rejected the salvation now offered to Jews and non-Jews alike. Paul emphasizes the sovereignty of God. And we don't know if that's true or not either, because the Bible, even in the New Testament, it speaks a lot of the Jews were, uh, and the Israelites, we were um, receiving the message of Christ when it was being taught um, a lot of times. So that, I don't know about that. Paul emphasizes the sovereignty of God and claims that the falling away of Israel is only temporary. He then deals with the practical obligations of the Christian life. He ends with greetings, the grace and doxology. Romans is a text of primary importance for the Christian theological tradition. Its teachings was especially influential in St. Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings, and it has profoundly affected the Western Christian outlook on sin, grace, merit, free will, justification, and predestination. Modern attempts at reapproachment with Judaism take their start from Romans 11 and Romans 13, 1 through 6 has been a force for social and political conservatism, especially in German Lutherism. And I've already given you the source. Uh, and right there, they're just talking about how you'll see as we go through Romans, how Paul lets you know in the latter times, um, there's going to be a reconciliation of the Israelites with Christ. But Gentiles get confused on that teaching. Okay, next we're going to get into some historical context. And as we move forward through Paul's epistles, you're going to want to refer to this historical context because this is the more overall um, one for the time. And most of his epistles were written around the same time. So this will cover all of them. When we get to the other books, um, we'll deal more specifically like what was going on around Galatia, at, you know, when the when Galatians was written, what was going on with Thessalonica when Thessalonians was written. Um, so it'll be a more narrow scope of historical context and um, it won't be as long as this one. So you'll want to refer to this this one as we go throughout all of um, Paul's epistles. <clears throat> In his religious policy, so we've already heard that the book of Romans was probably written somewhere around 58 AD, 59 AD, excuse me, the late the late 50s, maybe early 60s, but um, consensus is late 50s. So let's see what was going on around that time. In his religious policy, Claudius, though conservative by nature and antiquarian in interest, did not avoid all novelty. All novelty. He did much to restore the old religion of the state. He recognized the College of Haraspes, and in 47 AD, he managed to celebrate the secular games by reckoning their start from 613 BC instead of 666 BC, the date used by Augustus. The games were thus made to coincide with the 800th um, anniversary of the foundation of Rome. In another ceremony in 49 AD, he extended the old sacred boundary of Rome, the Pomerium, to include the Abitine and part of the campus Martius. This privilege belonged to the generals who had extended the imperial frontiers within which Claudius had brought Britain, Mauritania, and Thrice. And you notice there with Britain, um, so that's Britain as in today, and there was Celtic people in that area. There was also, at that time, there was also Celtic people in the northern portion of the Iberian Peninsula, also in France. They were called Gauls, and the Galatians also, um, which at that time were in Asia Minor. These are all Celtic people, which today now most Celtic people only live on the British Isles. But that just that just shows you their migration path. Um, just like our people migrated from the Middle East into Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so did the Celtic people. They came over from the steppe in the areas where the Scythians were um, and went across Asia Minor and went into Europe. 
All right, next. Taurus Emperor Worship. In reaction, oh, and you also see Mauritania. They had taken over Northwest. The Romans had incorporated Northwest Africa into their kingdom. And that's where you, you know, the word and the term Moors and stuff come from. But that's a, a lesson for, a history lesson for another day. Taurus Emperor Worship. In reaction against the wild extravagances of Gaius, Claudius reverted to the sensible attitude of Tiberius. In the famous letter that he wrote to the Alexandrians in 41, he said that he did not want a high priest or temples, for I do not wish to be offensive to my contemporaries. But naturally, he did not in general receive less honors than had Tiberius. Towards foreign religions, he was tolerant, where he regarded them as harmless to the older Roman ideas. So as long as your religion didn't come into conflict with uh, traditional um, Greco-Roman pagan beliefs, then he was cool with your uh, religion, supposedly. Thus he thought of transfer, transferring the Eleusian mysteries to Rome, but he expelled astrologers from Italy. Towards Druidism, he went further than his predecessors. If Tiberius had not already done so, Claudius decreed it, decreed its complete suppression. And Judaism was, Druidism was, um, the Celtic religion, which involved, um, trying to foretell the future by looking at birds and human sacrifice. And the way they would do human sacrifice, they would put you in an effigy of a wooden man, like a wicker man, and then set that um, wooden man on fire with human beings in it and burn you alive. So here in America, there is a thing called burning men, and um, it's in Nevada. And that's pretty much all these people are doing. They're going out into the desert, burning a large wicker man, doing an ancient... Celtic practice, which I know a lot of them don't even know that they're doing. All right. Towards the Jews, he reverted to the more generous attitude prevailing before Gaius and restored to them throughout the empire freedom of worship and exemption from the imperial cult. But in Rome, he was more severe. Though Tiberius' expulsion order had not been revoked, a large Jewish colony had reestablished itself in Rome. In 41 AD, Claudius denied them the right to hold meetings other than, and in parentheses there, they have other than those of the individual synagogues. And that's, and they have the question mark there is because we don't know if that was even included. They could have tried to bar them from doing, from even meeting in the synagogues. Um, excuse me. Presumably to stop them proselytizing and perhaps as a result of some disturbance. And doesn't that seem familiar to how they did us over here, uh, even in America, with their slave codes, where we couldn't get together and assemble? Um, we couldn't have our own religious services uh, independent on our own. Um, pretty similar. All right. Just history repeating itself uh, with our people. Presumably to stop them proselytizing and perhaps as a result of some disturbance. At any rate, in this same year, he wrote angrily to the Alexandrian Jews, accusing them of fomenting a universal plague. In 49, there was a further clash with the Jews in Rome, and they were apparently expelled. Whether the emerging new religion of Christianity had any influence on these events is uncertain, but Suetonius says that a riot provoked impulsive Cresto. Um, so there could have been Christian involvement as well in that riot because our, you know, in this, so the supposed clashing because the Christ, uh, a lot of the Christians in Rome were also Israelites because they're the ones who started the church there and then started teaching the, the Gentiles. Um, so that would go hand in hand. Um, also, we're going to read this later. as um, Once we're done with this background, um, the Bible mentions this event in the book of Acts when the Jews were kicked out of Rome or the Israelites were kicked out of Rome. Claudius also admitted the festival of Attis into the Roman calendar and reorganized his priestly colleges. The cult was robbed of some of his wilder features and was Romanized. The chief priest, the Archigalius, now had to be a Roman citizen and not an Eastern eunuch. On the night of July 18, 64 AD, when the sky was bright with the full moon, a fire broke out in Rome and raged over a week. It destroyed at least 10 of the 14 Augustan regions, three of them being totally gutted. Nero, who was at Antium, so now we've gone from Claudius to Emperor Nero, who came after Claudius in the 60s. Nero, who was at Antium when the disaster started, hurried back to Rome, helped to direct the firefighting, and undertook energetic measures 
to relieve the homeless. He then used the opportunity to benefit both Rome and himself. The rebuilding of the city was planned on more scientific lines compared with this earlier haphazard growth with the rectangular street system and blocks of skyscrapers. Okay. So now we're getting at the point where the fire of Rome, when Rome was um, set ablaze. And these are key things to remember. So we're looking at, because we're about to see where the Christians are going to get blamed. And so they get persecuted. And so this is the context that Paul is writing to the church in Rome. At. Um, you have the Jews who were, and the Israelites who were kicked out. You had, and you know, which included some Christians. Now we're about to read about how they got blamed for burning um, the sit trying to burn the city down. And so they were persecuted for that. So it's within this context to keep in mind that we're writing, I mean, that we're reading, um, the book of Romans. This was what was going on around that early church. Okay. For himself, Nero started to build on the ground between Esquilian and Salian Hills, where later the Colosseum was built. His vast golden palace, Domus Aurea, with its parks, lakes, colonnades, and a colossal 120-foot-high statue of Nero himself, together with statues and works of art for which his agents ransacked Greece. So they went into Greece and stole their artwork and stole things of their culture and brought it back to Rome. I'm just pointing this out because, like, like I always like to say, not everything is a conspiracy. Not everything is a conspiracy of the white man. Like, they, like, oh, they only target Africa to do that, to take their stuff back to Europe. No, they, they don't care. And no, and, and that's not even just them. Like, in all nations, like, they, they're not like they're specifically like, we're just going to do this only to the black nations. Um, anyway, so right here, you have white on white crime. You have Europeans. You have European civilization stealing from another European civilization their artwork and bringing it back to their their place. Anyways, just learning something on your way to learning something. Here he could indulge his artistic sense and his mania for the grandiose, while wits might declare that his expor expropriations not only engulfed the city but would soon embrace the, the, they, ten miles distant. In their loss and misery, the city populace turned against Nero and accused him of having started the fire, while rumor added that he had watched the burning city from the Tower of Messines and had sung as and had sung as an area over it his own sack of Troy. Neither charge can be taken seriously. If he had wished to destroy Rome, he would hardly have chosen a bright moonlit summer night when the movement of his fire raisers would have been hard to hide but he was suspected and in order to divert suspicion from himself he sought a scapegoat he might have turned to the jews who were always unpopular with the mob so notice that there the israelites were unpopular unpopular amongst the gentiles in rome there was definitely racial um i won't even say racial but national whatever you want to call it tensions cultural tensions racial tensions between the Israelites and the uh, and the um, the Gentiles or the Jews and Gentiles in Rome, um, so he might have turned to the Jews who were always unpopular with the mob. But his wife, Pop but his wife Papapia, Papia was interested in Judaism, and her interest may have saved him. Instead, there was the new sect of Christians that was now growing up in Rome, about which little was known except that it was popularly credited with humini generis odium it is one of the it is one of the anomalies of history that a sect which on the human plane apart from its theological claims was preaching the brotherhood of man should have been so misunderstood but the secrecies of the meetings helped to give rise to such ideas that the christians practiced cannibalism an idea based probably on a misunderstanding of the lord's supper and notice there that, so they thought, people in the Roman world thought that um, the early church and early Christians might have been cannibals because of the Lord's Supper and the Passover, which is really just Passover. And um, also you see here that they had to hold secret meat, like they had to hold their services in secret, kind of underground. That's how the church started, because um, they faced a lot of persecution for trying to practice uh, out in the open at that time. OK, so this is also within the context that Paul is writing to the Romans. So keep in mind, as we're reading Rome, you have to sometimes when Paul is talking to these Gentiles, especially like he's saying things because he knows this is a matter of life or death for you. So there are some things where it's like 
okay, why, if you're not ready to commit to this thing unto death, why am I going to tell you to get circumcised right now? That doesn't make, you see, so hopefully now you'll have better understanding of uh, some of Paul Paul's writings as we go forward. Here were suitable victims, and Nero took savage action. Insofar as Christians were charged with insidiarism, and mind you, when it's saying Christians, the bulk of these are going to be Israelites, because they're the ones who started the church um, with some Gentiles. But it's still going to be a lot of Israelites. Insofar as Christians were charged with insidiarism, the charge must normally have broken down. And it is only Tactius that connects the persecution with the fire. And they will have been persecuted as Christians. There is little evidence for any persecution outside Rome, but here their punishment was terrible. Some were thrown to the beasts in the amphitheater, and others were smeared with pitch and used by Nero as living torches to light the games he held by night in the Imperial Gardens and Vatican Circus. So you notice here that um, Nero basically put grass and things on them and then lit them on fire stuck something up them up their rectum probably and then used them as human torches um which is savage that's just about the same way they used to hang us from trees and do stuff uh <laughs> to our bodies so like similar just crazy stuff also notice here the vatican circus look that up on your own time but part of where the vatican is it used to be uh, a place where they did uh pagan ritual entertainment stuff um back in ancient rome and that's now where the vatican is and it was called the Vatican Circus. Um, just more learning on your way to, to learning. All right. Interesting place for the Catholic Church to put their, their uh, little headquarters. This attempt to divert hostility from himself, however, recoiled on Nero's own head because the ruthlessness of the punishment excited pity, excited pity for the victims who were regarded as sacrifice to one man's cruelty rather than to the national interest. Nero also has some plans for Africa, though their exact nature is uncertain. In 61 to 63 AD, a detachment of Praetorian soldiers was sent up the Nile past Moreau to the marshes of the White Nile. This is getting into like Central Africa territory um, where the Romans went. This was perhaps a scientific expedition designed to discover the source of the Nile, or it, may, or it may have been a reconnaissance for a campaign against the king of Axum. That's the modern day country of Ethiopia in that area. In any case, no Ethiopian war ensued. On military and probably on economic grounds, it was unnecessary. Though a victory in such distant and mysterious lands might have appealed to Nero's vanity. So this was also going on in the world and at that time that we're reading about in Romans. This is kind of what was going on in Africa. At the time, the great revolt that flared up in Palestine in 66 AD was the result of old grievances and protracted disturbances. It was not a happy land. It suffered from internal stresses, both economic and religious. Excuse me. There was tensions between rich and poor, between Sadducee and Pharisee, between Jew and Samaritan, between Jew and non-Jew, especially Greek and between Jew and Christian. Because there was a in Judea, it was very diverse at the time. Um, it wasn't, and even we're talking about now in Israel, it wasn't just all Israelites living in Judea. You had a lot of different groups and you also had Edomites who were counted as Jews at this time because they had been converted and they were all considered Judeans also living there. Interesting thing though with the Samaritans, I'm going to show you a couple pictures from the Jewish encyclopedia, um, that were taken, you know, like late 1800s, early 1900s when before, um, they went over there in 1948 to try to reestablish Israel. Um, some pictures of what the Samaritans look like, and you're going to see that the Samaritans were black. Um, and that's also because if you read where they said that the Samaritans came from, where they put where the Assyrians took the people from, um, three of those cities were Hamitic cities. There were Babylon, and Babylon was founded by Nimrod, and this is before the Chaldeans had taken it over. So then that's a Cushite. You had Ava or the Avites, which were a Canaanite group. Um, you have Hamath, which was also another Canaanite group. So these are all black um, African peoples. The fourth, there's a fourth one that we don't know where it, you know, where they came from bloodline wise. But 
it's assumed that they were Canaanites as well. And then the fifth group came from Mesopotamia, Cutta, uh, which was in Me Mesopotamia. Uh, but I'm going to show you a picture, and you're going to see that the Samaritans um, were also black. Little wonder that some men had turned to a less complicated life like that of the Essenes and a landmark in history established the, mon the monastic community at Qumran on the Dead Sea, whose scriptures now partially survive. The famous Dead Sea Scrolls. Above all, there was a common hatred of Rome, although this was moderated among the upper class, which looked to Rome to protect its interests. This sentiment naturally was nationalistic in aim and sought to throw off the yoke of the unclean and idolatrous Gentile. Feelings were often further exaggerated by Roman lack of tact, since Roman policy towards the Jews in general had tended to fluctuate between great generosity or undue harshness. True, there had been no religious persecution as such, and the Jews had been granted freedom of worship and association. The mad folly of Gaius had been counteracted by Claudius' reestablishment of a native ruler. But the reversion to provincial status after Agrippa's brief rule, 41 to 44 AD, will have re-emphasized Judea's dependence on Rome. His son, Agrippa II, was well treated by Rome. In 50, he was given chalice, the kingdom of his uncle Herod, who had died. And in 53 AD, he, revived and he received in exchange for Chalcis, Philip's tetrarchy, Traconitus, Galantis, etc., and that of Licinius, and in parentheses they have Abilene, to which Nero added part of Galilee and Perea. The Roman proc procurators obviously had no easy task with so recalling rack reckless trent reckless trent. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm probably butchering that. So reckless trent reckless recalcitrant people a recalcitrant people, but they were too often incom incompetent. Um, Cuspius Fadus in 44 AD had killed a prophet and agitator named Thaddeus, whose successor, Tiberius Alexander, was a renegade Jew and his successor. Vendidius Cumanus in from 48 to 52 AD crushed some fighting between Jews and Samaritans with such rigor that he himself was court-martialed and exiled. So this is what's going on in Israel and, you know, at the time we're reading about in Romans around that time. You're having infighting between Jews and Greeks, between our Israelites and Greeks, between Israelites and the Samaritans. Um, also between the, from a religious standpoint, between Christians and non-Christians, between politically, between Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, the region that, you know, that area at the time was in deep turmoil. So this is what's going on with the Israelites at the time that Paul is writing the book of Romans. The next procurator, the next procurator was Antonius Felix from 52 AD to 60 AD, brother of the freedman Paulus and husband of a Jewish Drusilla, the sister of Agrippa II. And you can find him mentioned in the book of Acts as well. Uh, he had to face increasing social unrest from bands of fanatical robbers, um, the Sicarii are men of the knife who plundered the rich and pro-Romans, and also from a violent group of zealots led by Eleazar, son of the high priest. He had to deal with rioting between Greeks and Jews in Caesarea, and it was he who tried St. Paul, whom he kept in confinement as he judged that as he judged that release would be politically dangerous. This is also in the book of Acts. Like other governors, he had only some 3,000 local troops at his disposal. Although in grave difficulty, he could appeal to the governor of Syria for legendary help. The next governor, Porcius Festus, was relieved of the problem of St. Paul when the latter appealed to Caesar, also in the book of Acts. But he had other difficulties. When Festus died and before his successor, Albinus, arrived, the Sadducee high priest took the chance to crush some opponents including James, the brother of Jesus, who was stoned to death. Finally, under uh, Jesseus Florus from 64 AD to 66 AD, the storm broke. The immediate cause was some rioting at Caesarea, 
and in Jerusalem, where the high priest refused to sacrifice to Jehovah on behalf of the emperor, and where, despite the intervention of Agrippa, the small Roman garrison was massacred. Faced with the spread of this order, Florus called in the legate of Syria, who arrived with some 30,000 men, but winter was approaching and dared not assault Jerusalem, but withdrew. This was 66 AD. As the rebellion was extending to the whole of Palestine, Nero approached. Nero appointed a new governor of Syria, uh, Licinius Mucinus, and put a tried soldier, um, Tiberius Flavius Vespinius, in command of expedition against Judea. Vespasian's plan was to use his three legions to reduce Palestine district by district and thus isolate Jerusalem before the final attack. In 67 AD, he reduced Galilee, which was defended by Josephus, a Philo-Roman Pharisee who managed to survive and to pass over to the winning side. He gained pardon and friendship from Vespasian, whose elevation to the throne he prophesied. In 68, Vespasian reduced that savage. Uh, that's real savage. Sold out his own. Um, anyways. In 68, Vespasian reduced Samaria and Idumea. But, and that's something too for the cats who are just big on, on Israel, Israelites, Israelites. You know, we are the people, our people, our people, our people, our people. Like, man, your own people will sell you out, chief. Like, I would just focus on Christ and the commandments. In 68 AD, Vespasian reduced Samaria and Idumea. But when news came of the death of Nero, he slowed down operations. During all this time, Palestine had been far from united in its opposition to the Romans, and there had been much fighting between Jews and Gentiles, while Jerusalem became the scene of bitter fighting between three Jewish factions. Thus, when Vespasian went off to seek the Principate and left his son, Titus, to conduct the final siege of Rome, thus invested a city, Titus invested a city divided against itself. Nevertheless, the resistance was fanatically heroic. But in August 70 AD, the city fell and was sacked. The sequel is soon told. The temple was destroyed. The Sanhedrin and high priesthood were abolished. The annual contribution paid by every pious Jew to the temple was diverted, was diverted to Jupiter Capitolinus. And mind you, Jesus had already died on a cross like 40 years before this or a little under 40 years before this and um, had told them they don't need to do animal sacrifice anymore. So... They shouldn't have even been still doing animal sacrifice. And Jesus told them that um, the temple was going to be destroyed soon. Um, but anyway, just learning something on your way to learning something. Um, the Jewish state ceased to exist as a political entity, but Judaism as a religion continued and was even protected as in the past. Its followers being allowed their Sabbath, freedom from military service and exemption from the imperial cult. Judea remained a Roman province, but the equestrian procurator now became the subordinate to a senatorial legate who commanded the 10th legion, which henceforth garrisoned himself in Jerusalem. When after the reign and death of Titus, 81 AD, a commemorative arch was erected in his honor. All Rome was reminded by its sculptures of the end of Jerusalem. And this is the source that I just read from, where um, I got that information from. Okay, here's a map of the Roman Empire, circa 117 AD. So this is roughly maybe like 57 years after Paul wrote the Epistle to the Romans. But it's still pretty accurate to the same the, to the time Paul wrote the epistle, as far as the ext the extent that the Roman Empire extended. So you see it in portions of the Middle East, or what is called the Middle East, which is really just Northeast Africa. You see them in North Africa, throughout Western Europe, even over into uh, the modern day British Isles. But I'm gonna leave this up for a bit, just so you can take a look at it and familiarize yourself with it.
All right, this is a picture of some Samaritans living in Palestine and Israel in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And I got this from the Jewish Encyclopedia. If you look at the Samaritan entry in the Jewish Encyclopedia, you can find these pictures. Um, and as you can see, the Samaritans were black. And remember, the Bible tells us that of the five cities that the Samaritans originated from, three for sure were Hamitic. There were two Canaanite cities and one Cush, one city founded by Cushites. Then a fourth city that we're pretty sure was a Canaanite city. And then the fifth city was in Mesopotamia. As you can still see, 2,000 years later, the Samaritans still look black. Um, also, this relates to the his Remember, in our historical background, there was beef between the Israelites and the Samaritans in Judea <clears throat> at the time Paul was writing um, the epistle to the Romans. But I just wanted you to see what the Samaritans look like. Okay, so now we want to cover some key points. If you remember in the historical background, we talked about, uh, we covered in the historical record how Claudius had expelled all of the Israelites or all of the Jews out of Rome. So now we're going to go in the Bible and see where the Bible lines up with history. Um, in Acts 18, verses 1 through 2, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came on to them. So you see here, even in Acts chapter 17, I mean Acts chapter 18, it verifies the historical record lines up with the Bible and the Bible lines up with the historical record. Um, the Israelites were kicked out of Rome circa 50 AD by Claudius. Um, second key point on here from after we've gotten background and covered the historical um, context. The first church in Rome was founded by Israelites. After our expulsion from Rome circa 50 AD by Claudius, some began, some began to return after his death. Those returning in the 60s AD found a church completely controlled by Gentiles. So these the, the Israelites that were kicked out of Rome who started the early church there have been kicked out with the with the Israelites who didn't even practice Christianity. The ones who were still practicing what you want to, I guess, call Judaism, but I don't like to use that term. Uh, those who were still just practicing strictly Old Testament and still um, observing the sacrificial law. Uh, they were kicked out as long as well as the Israelites who were also Christians. That's why we were reading in Acts about Aquila and uh, uh, Priscilla. But anyways, excuse me, uh, when they got when they returned, they're the ones who started the church. But then when they returned in the 60s there and at the time when Paul is writing to the Romans, uh, the epistle of, of the Romans, the uh, Israelites are returning back to Rome and now finding the church completely controlled by Gentiles. OK, um, are Europeans. Tensions quickly arose between the groups as to who was to lead Christ's church. And that's some of what we're going to get into as we go through the book of Romans, because Paul deals with this, the tension between the Israelites and the Gentiles. Um, it is within this context and the historical background covered that the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul wrote his epistle to the church at Rome. Um, key point number three, I just wanted to bring out the conquest of Britain. Under Claudius, um, that took place during um, this time. Also, uh, and I've explained before how they're related to the Galatians. And then the fourth key point is we want to bring out the Edomite component. You have to remember that the Maccabees forced the Edomites to convert to Judaism. You also have to remember even before that, that the Idumea kept creeping up further north into southern portions of Judah's land. And um, when they were converted to Judaism... They just uh, were referred to by the outside world as Judeans. So when you when they talk about Judeans, it would include the Edomites who were living there. Just like Herod um, was an Edomite, there were lots of Edomites living in Judea at the time. <clears throat> so you always need to be cognizant of where there's Israelites at this time. You're gonna find Edomites as well who are practicing Jude who are gonna who are who were practicing Judaism. Quote unquote. Okay. Let's move forward. 
Okay, as we read chapters one and two, these are the key points we're going to touch on. Um, I will try to remember to post this in the community uh, section as well. <clears throat> so you can follow along. Um, one, Paul in verse one establishes authority as being directly called by Christ and sanctified by the word of God. See Acts 1 through 22 and Galatians 1, 11 through 24. In verse 3, he establishes Jesus as the Messiah, king of the line of David. In verse 4, he establishes his death, burial, and resurrection and his membership in the Godhead as the Son. In verses 13 through 14, he establishes that his call is on is on to the Gentiles or Europeans. Verse uh, point five. In verse 16, and I'm sorry for the, the there's a couple typos in here. In verse 16, because of the tension between Gentiles and Rome and Israelites, he must reassert that everything goes through Israel first. And see John 4.22. In verse 18 through 32, he warns the Gentiles in Rome to not mix paganism in with Christianity. He explains how all mankind knows there is a God by looking around them at the created world. He warns them that if they hold the truth and then pervert it with paganism and false doctrine, that they will be given over to all manner of sin. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, they deal with those who judge others while committing sins themselves. Paul warns against this, explains the consequences of such actions. Uh, <clears throat> in verses 9 through 10 of chapter 2, he establishes Israel as first again and that everything must go through Jacob. Verses 11 through 12 of chapter 2, um, see, it's supposed to be James 2. Um, verses 8 through 13, uh, point 10, verses 14 through 16 of chapter 2, he explains how most of the world knows of the laws of God, some naturally by having a conscience. Verses 17 through 29 of chapter 2, Paul admonishes the Israelites in the Roman church. Um, being a physical Israelite in terms of eternity means nothing. One must be a Jew inwardly. Um, these are the things covered in chapters 1 through 2, so we're going to read chapters 1 through 2 and um, break them down um, for this Bible study, our Friday night Bible study. Amen. All right, so let's move forward. All right, so as I like to say, let's dive on in. Um, at our church, we want you to, we want everybody to learn. So that's why we went through that historical background and the background of the epistle and the historical context, because here the objective is to learn. So now let's go in. Now that you have that understanding, let's start reading um, from chapter one of Romans, verse one. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be a, an apostle, separated onto the gospel of God. Um, right there, Paul is letting you know that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. He was called to be an apostle and separated, which is the same thing as sanctified, that he was sanctified unto the word of God. So his whole, he was set apart and his whole life is dedicated to the word of God, but that he was called to be an apostle. So he's establishing with the church here in Romans, his apostleship and his authority to speak, because there were some issues with Paul that Paul had to deal with because he wasn't around. He didn't learn directly from Jesus when Jesus was alive on earth, like the disciples and some of the other apostles had. The, Paul learned from Jesus directly, but he learned from Jesus after Jesus had ascended to heaven and Jesus came down and taught him. But let's go and read this, okay? Um, let's go over to, let's go over to Acts. Um, wonder what chapter this was. I have the verses. I have the, the verses, but not the chapter. Man, there were so many typos. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, it'll be in the community section. It's in the community section without typos. Those will be corrected. Uh, let's see. This is Cornelius. So it's got to be before that. All right, it's chapter 9. Um... Let's start at Acts chapter 9, and we're going to start at verse 1. Acts chapter 9, and we're going to start at verse 1. And Saul, with, that's Paul, um, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went on to the high priest. 
Um, and he saw because he was named after King Saul. You have to remember Paul was a Benjamite. Okay. Um, but his Hebrew name was Saul. Verse two. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, and this way is talking about Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound onto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Excuse me. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And there he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Because you remember Paul was persecuting the church at first because he was a Pharisee, a very learned and, and, and intelligent Pharisee at that. That's why his sometimes his his writings are hard for people to understand because he was very knowledgeable in the law. Um, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. So Paul was the one who was sent out to the Gentiles, the Europeans. He was also to minister before kings, which he did. He appealed unto Caesar even. And he was also a minister unto Israelites as well. We forget that. It wasn't, there were also Israelites that Paul ministered to as well. And the book of Hebrews that he wrote is directly to the Israelites. Um, verse, where are we at? Verse 16. For I will show him how great thing, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Notice here he was baptized, and he was baptized with water. Okay? And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. All right. So right there you see that Paul was called directly by Christ to his apostleship. And he had in the beginning of Romans, in the first verse of Romans chapter one, he had to reestablish that with the church at Romans. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter um, one out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let a thing be established line upon line, precept upon precept here a little there a little. So let's look at Galatians chapter one and um, verse 11. And let's get Paul telling the story himself because Luke wrote the book of Acts. So Luke was, is telling that story. About Paul, but let's let's let Paul tell the story himself. Uh, Galatians chapter one and verse eleven. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversion in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Man, he wasted it. 
Verse 14, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And notice here in verse 15, he said, but when it pleased God who separated me. When we go back into Romans 1 and verse 1, you'll see, remember he said he was separated to the gospel are sanctified to the word of God, okay? Um, 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal the son, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, that just means other nations, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. So you notice here, he's letting you know when he got converted, he didn't go to the disciples or other apostles in Jerusalem and get taught. He went into the desert in Arabia and then back into the, into Damascus and, uh, and Christ taught him himself. All right. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save J James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Sicilia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. OK, so out of the mouth of Paul here, we are getting um, his side of things. All right. And we just also read it in Acts. All right. So let's go back to Romans now. And pick back up. Romans 1 and 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And so he's establishing there, because that's for the Israelites to establish that, yes, Christ is of the line of David. He's that Messiah that was promised to come. Okay? It's just in his first coming, he wasn't coming here to rule with the iron fist like the Israelites were expecting. Um, that comes later. You know, that comes in his uh, second coming. OK. All right. And declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So right there, Paul, too, is affirming Christ's death, burial and resurrection, that indeed Christ died, was buried and was resurrected. Because there were some already in the early church starting to doubt that. You had people who didn't believe that Christ rose from the dead. And you also had people, you had Sadducees, and then you had also people trying to creep into the church who didn't believe in the resurrection at all. Like no resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in the first resurrection um, or any of that. Okay. Um, let's keep reading. Verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And we know what a saint is. We have, we've covered that a lot here in the church. A saint is someone who keeps the commandments. Okay, That's the qualifications for being a saint. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice there, you're, as we go through these epistles, you're going to notice that Paul always in the beginning of his epistles only mentions the Father and the Son. He doesn't mention the Holy Ghost as a part of the Godhead because the Holy Ghost is not a part of the Godhead. The Trinity is a pagan concept. You won't find that anywhere in the, you won't, you're not going to find the Trinity anywhere in the Bible. Verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. All right. Look at the notes. All right. So now he's going to establish his call onto the Gentiles. 
here in verses 13 and 14. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I proposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So Paul is expressing how he's been wanting to come to Rome to build them up so that he can have fruit amongst those Europeans, the Italians and whoever else is in the Gentiles living in the church at Rome at that time. Because he had already had fruit from other churches like the church at Philippi, at Thessalonica, at Galatia, at different places where he had he had been watering okay, and doing his ministry. And he wanted to have some fruit in Rome as well. Um, verse 14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So Paul is saying here that he's a debtor to, to the Greeks, that's self-explanatory. And the barbarians at this time, these were people um, who didn't speak, who didn't know Greek or Latin or what was considered to be a civilized language. And so they called them barbarians because to them, their their sound, their language was like bar, 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 like nonsense. So at this time, a lot of barbarians is actually referring to Germanic peoples. That's who was viewed as barbarians. But any tribes or ethnic groups at that time who didn't speak what was considered to be a civilized language was considered to be a um, barbarian. Uh, where are we at? Verse 15. So much as in me, as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So he was ready to preach that gospel. But you see here, he establishes that his call is on is on to the Gentiles. Um, next, we're about to cover in these last verses, 18 through 32, we're going to cover how he warns the Gentiles in Rome not to mix paganism in with Christianity. And he explains how all mankind knows there is a God by looking around them and at the created world. Um, because if you look around the world, the world around you is pretty obvious there's a God. He also warns them that if they hold the truth and then pervert it with paganism and false doctrine, that they will be given over to all manner of sin. Okay, and we experienced that today and tomorrow's Sabbath lesson at noon when we cover the Nicolaitans and the ways of Balaam and Jezebel. We're going to get into that. That's pretty much what that whole lesson is about. But most so-called Christians today, most of these uh, Roman Christian churches, that's what they do. They have some truth, and but they've mixed it in with false doctrine and paganism. All right, verse 18, um, or are we at seven? No, verse 16, I want to read this again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. All right, and notice here, he has to establish that, uh, he's establishing here in verse 16 that it's to the Jew first, then to the Greek, Okay. People always, when they, they always like to run to the verse where it's like, um, you know, neither Jew nor Greek, but then they don't know how to explain something like this, where he's saying to the Jew first, then to the Greek. The thing is, is it's like this. When we don't keep the commandments because we're God's people, he whoop on us first. He's going to deal and judge his people first. But when it comes to the rewards, he's also going to reward his people first. And Jacob is the apple of his eye. But let's get a precept for this. Because Paul says here, um, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. All right, so let's get another precept. Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 22. Let the scripture explain itself. Why did, why did Paul say to the Jew first and then the Greek? Well, let's find out from Jesus because Jesus said something similar. All right. John chapter four and verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what we, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So notice what Jesus said here in John chapter four, verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So Paul here is just reestablishing that fact in Romans that it's going to be on to the Jew first. OK, and if you want the salvation, you're going to have to come through. You're going to have to go through Israel. That's just the way the book plays it out. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 1. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
So right here is letting you know that his God's wrath is already set up for all them people who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That means right now I'm holding the truth. And unrighteousness is, is breaking the commandments. So if you a pastor or you someone, you at a church and you know the truth and you teaching people something contrary to this word, or you know the truth and you're doing stuff contrary to this word, then what's in store for you? What does the book say? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So you have the wrath of God coming for you. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understand by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. He's just letting you know you can look around nature, look at the creation. And if you can't tell that there's a God, there's something wrong with you. That's simply put. That's what he's that's what Paul is saying here. OK. And also, I I did a lesson on uh, the lunar conjunction and the new moon and how that stuff works. And people who are just like you have to observe and how that's not historically accurate. Like even the invisible things in the sky, you can plot without even seeing them. Uh just learning something on your way to learning something. But verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Examples of this, it's Christmas time. We're just going to use Christmas as the example. Let's read verse 21 again and let's put it into a Christmas context. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So they know God. They go to church on Sunday. They think they know. They read the Bible. And then they're saying, and they think they know God. But then they're doing something like Christmas. But they don't know him as the true God, which is the God of this Bible and what he says to do. They've created their own vain imaginations. Okay. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. And that's true. I've seen people, like, I've seen Gentiles on TV, like on news channels, trying to debate the legitimacy of, of Christmas from a biblical perspective and using Jesus. And it's like... Per, Thinking they were wise, they became fools, okay? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And isn't that true? You bring in the Christmas tree on Easter, you got your freaking Easter bunny and all of that stuff. You're taking the image of God and put it in into a, and, and making it into a corruptible image. And you're not supposed to make any images of God in the first place anyway. Um, all right, verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Um, it's like, okay, uncleanliness, that's self-explanatory. That's talking about the cleanliness type of laws. He's given them up over to all manner of uncleanliness, which is, you know, which is nasty. That's, that's just nasty. All right, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which was against nature. So you started having women being involved with other women instead of being involved with a man. Verse 27. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. So now that's talking about men being with men. So notice here what it says, that when you hold the truth in unrighteousness, and you keep doing that, eventually these are the things that are going to happen to you. If you study American history, the United States has always had a knowledge of God. The United States has always had access to the Bible and they bring it up in even a lot of their uh, politics and legal things. I covered that when I did the lesson on Thanksgiving. Uh, America holds the truth in unrighteousness. And that's why now God has given us up 
the nation as a whole has been given up to a reprobate mind. And that's why you see more of these things happening now. These type of sins because God has given things. The nation has been doing what he said not to do. And then he gave consequences for if you do this particular thing. And so now America is experiencing those consequences. Uh, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, inventors of evil things. Think of all the evil things man, man has created. That man, that even we were just talking about to, uh, them being given up to a certain mind and men with men and women with women. Think of some of the devices that have been made in order to make that happen, woman on woman. Why would you, man, create such evil inventions? All right. That's what this is talking about. All right. 30. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, impalicable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Oh, that's cold. So Paul's like, not only do you have pleasure doing it, you take pleasure in seeing other people do it, even though you know that the judgment for that is going to be death. All right, let's move on to chapter two and continue to bring it out. Let's right, see. All right, so now we're about to jump into chapter two, verses one through ten deal with those who judge others while committing the sins themselves. Um, Paul warns against that, obviously. You should not be condemning other people when you're doing the same sins that they're doing. That's uh, milk stuff. That's ABC Christianity right there. That's that's a no, no. But let's read it. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And the judgment of God that's according to truth against them that commit those things is this book, this Bible. He's going to judge you based out of that. And have you broken the things that he said in here not to do? And he's going to judge you by him. Three, and thinkest thou this, O man, and judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? So right here he's letting you know that, like some people, they think because they haven't been molly whopped by God yet that some, you know, oh, I'm going to continue to keep sinning. It's no big deal. Not really realizing that the only reason why God hasn't killed you yet is because he's been patient, you know, to try to lead you to repentance. But you're dumb behind. And I could say dumb A because the de dumb A word is in the Bible. But my, my wife is against me, you know, saying that stuff. So I won't. But if you want to be a dummy and, you know, not repent, then he's eventually going to get you. But he's being merciful because he's trying to lead you to repentance. That's what Paul is saying here. Verse 5, but after thy hardness and impotent, impotent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And so he's just letting you know that every single day you just keep stacking up sins that are being recorded in heaven. That's being recorded. And when judgment day comes, it's going to be brought back up on you. And you're going to have to pay the price. Six, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Uh-oh, that throws out I'm saved by grace and I don't need no works. It's just grace. That throws that out. We're reading the book here. He says, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So according to your works, according to how you lived your life is how God is going to reward you. All right. And you were not a good person and you weren't keeping the commandments. He's going to reward you with fire. For eternity. All right. Verse eight. I mean, verse seven. To whom by patient continuance and well doing 
seek for glory and honor and immorality and immorality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey on righteousness and indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. So notice there, even when it comes to the punishments, it's going to be laid out on the Israelites first because we know better. Remember, we were given the oracles of God. In Psalms, it tells you he's only known one nation. Jacob have I known. So when it comes to the punishments, Israel is going to get it first. When it comes to the blessings, Israel is going to get it first. You don't like it. Like I always say, take it up with God. Don't get mad with me. I just read what it says. You don't have to. Like My biggest thing with this stuff is you don't have to believe the Bible. You don't even have to call yourself a Christian. That's what gets on my nerves the most is people who call themselves Christians and say they believe in the Bible, but then have ideas that are completely contrary to the Bible. It's like, just stop believing. You don't have to believe in this. We're just reading a book and telling you what the book says. Either you believe it or you don't believe it. All right. Verse 11. Um, For there is no respect of person with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. All right. So now we're going into. Um, now we're going to go to James chapter two and read something in conjunction with this, because notice here he says, for there is no respect of person with God. That means he's not respecting anybody can receive salvation. Verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without the law. Meaning those who didn't have the law and didn't keep it um, are going to perish without having, even though they didn't have it, they're still going to uh, get tossed in the lake of fire. And that's not, that's fair because they, he just told you, you can look around creation and see that God exists. And some things, and he even talks about some, we're going to get into that, like some things are just, even in your conscience, you know better. For example, one of the cleanliness laws is you should not lay with a woman when she's on her menstrual cycle. You don't need the Bible to tell you you shouldn't stick your thing in a, in a woman when she's on her menstrual cycle. That's common sense. I would never do that. I don't need the Bible to tell me to do that. And if you're the type of dude who does something like that and you feel some type of way because I just said that, you're a savage. And I don't mean that in the like in the slang way. I mean that in a literal definition way. You are a savage, uncivilized barbarian. All right, and you need to stop that. All right. Um, where are we at? We are in do, 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 back to 12. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Self-explanatory. So if you've had the law and the commandments and you broke them, you're going to be judged too. Everybody gets judged. Verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So let's go over to where did I say we want to go? We want to look at James chapter 2. And in verses 8 through 13, James chapter 2, and in verses 8 through 13, provide a little bit more clarity on what we just read, because it relates. All right, James chapter 2, we're starting at verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors and remember like we just talked about how God Paul talked about how in Romans we just read how God is not a respecter of persons and now James is telling you we should not be a respecter of person and if you are then you know you transgress verse 10 for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of all for he that said do not commit adultery said also do not kill now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. And that law of liberty is just talking about our freedom from animal sacrifice. But just because you have that freedom, it's not a license of sin. And notice James here is telling you the same thing that Paul is saying in Romans. Another out of the mouth of two witnesses, let a thing be established. He says, so speak ye, and so do. So don't if you saying one thing about your life in your walk with Christ, then you need to do it. Don't judge somebody else. That's what James is saying here. Don't judge somebody else. Just like Paul is saying when you're doing the same thing or committing other sins. OK, be thou perfect. Then, you know, if you at that point, 
then you can, you know, you want to say something, you can. But until then, don't judge somebody else. God is the judge, okay? And judging doesn't mean if you see somebody sinning, you tell them, hey, you know, man, that's a sin. Let them know it's wrong. You know what I'm talking about? That's not the same thing as judging, like already making, casting condemnation on them, all right, when you're doing the same stuff. All right, now, back to Romans chapter 2, and we're at verse 14. For, but let's look at the notes. All right, so this last part, this one, well, not last part, the next two verses what I was talking about, where your conscience let, will let you know, okay, about some things. It's just common sense. A lot of the commandments are really just common sense. All right. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, which is their minds, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So he's just letting you know there that there is con you have a conscience. Like when you steal, your conscience is going to tell you that's wrong. Even if, the, even if you never even heard the Ten Commandments, like the child who is brought up by an atheist will inherently know that stealing is wrong. You know how that child knows stealing is wrong? It's because when they're doing it, they're looking around and they're trying not to get caught. So if they're, you're trying not to get caught, you already know you're doing something wrong. All right? You don't even need the Ten Commandments to even tell you that. That's what Paul is saying here. That's why everybody on the planet Earth is of no excuse when it comes to the judgment. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what Paul is uh, saying here. All right. Just like I discussed earlier, you don't need a commandment to tell you not to stick your thing in a woman when she's on her menstrual cycle. Um, that's common sense. All right. Your mind should tell you I shouldn't be doing that. All right. But for the knuckleheads, that's why we got this book. All right. Praise God. Let's keep going. Verse 16. So now Paul's going to start dealing with. This last part of the chapter, now he's switching over to the Israelites. So this first part of the chapter, he's focusing on the Gentiles. And that's something else you have to keep in mind as we go through Paul's epistles. Sometimes in the chapter, Paul might be talking to Gentiles. At another part in the chapter, he might be talking to Israelites. At another part of the next chapter, he might be talking to both Gentiles and Israelites. You, you just got to pay attention to the context that you're reading. So now we're about to switch over to where Paul admonishes the Israelites in the Roman church. That being a physical Israelite, when it comes to eternity, means nothing. That one must be a Jew inwardly. That just because you're a physical Israelite, if you're not keeping no commandments, you're not going to make it. All right, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That's a bold statement Paul made. Paul just said that Christ is going to judge people by his gospel. But Paul can say that because Paul learned from the mouth of Christ. We covered that. Verse 17, behold, thou art called a Jew and rest in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Verse 19, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. He's talking about here how the Israelites have that. We know that we're supposed to be a nation of priests. We should. And so we're supposed to be trying to lead other people. And so Paul's talking about how we lead, try to lead other people out of darkness and out of blindness when we are still blind ourselves. But let's keep reading. Verse 20. An instructor of the, of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou, therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Verse 22. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Uh, and that's true. Even to this day, the reason why the world is in the, in the mess that it's in, and nobody is following the Bible truly, we're not keeping Sabbath, they're doing pagan holidays, all of these things, and they're doing this stuff in the name of Christ, even though it's blasphemous, it's because the Israelites did not do their job. If the Israelites did their job, which was to be a nation of priests, then we then the name of God would not be blasphemed among the Gentiles, right? And the name of God is definitely blasphemed among the Gentiles. You got a pagan holiday called Christmas, and they put Jesus on it. You got another pagan holiday called Easter, they put Jesus on it. 
you go to a movie, every other word, GD this, GD that, G. I could go on, but I'm not. But the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles because our people, who were supposed to be a nation of priests, did not do their job. And that's what Paul is saying here because he's addressing this now to the Israelites specifically in Rome. Uh, verse 25. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made on circumcision. Now notice here, even with the circumcision, you have to read in between what Paul says. Paul just said that the circumcision does profit if you keep the commandments. Physical circumcision. If you keep the commandments, then it'll profit you. But if you don't keep the commandments and you're physically circumcised, you're not going to make the kingdom. Right? Just like if you are keeping other commandments, but you don't get physically circumcised, you're not making the first resurrection. We can read that, okay? That's all Paul is saying here. Let's take the spookery out of stuff. All right, verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he And we covered that in our Sabbath lesson last week. Remember, everything's lining up. Remember with the Commonwealth of Israel, and I gave you examples of where people from other nations, the Queen of Sheba is going to judge some Israelites at the judgment, and that um, the city of Nineveh, those that repented at, um, at Jonah's preaching, we read, Jesus said that they're going to judge some people at the, some Israelites at the judgment too. So you're going to end up having Gentiles, who end up making the kingdom and judging Israelites who didn't make the kingdom. How silly is that? That's that, that that's like when I say silly is just like how to put ourselves in that type of situation. All right. On um, verse 28, for he is not for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew and he's just talking about you have to be circumcised in your heart which is your mind. And you do that being, by being washed with the word of God and sanctifying your mind with the word of God. Um, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. OK, so I hope this uh, Bible study was good. I hope you tune in for the Sabbath uh, tomorrow at noon. I also hope that uh, you'll tune in next Friday same time we'll be going into we'll be doing at least chapters three four and five if we can do some more great um the this one we can only do two because we did a lot of historical background and a lot of historical context so let's close out the um sabbath lesson with a quick prayer our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right. Shalom. I will see you all tomorrow.